Thank you for that inspiring talk. Uh, our next speaker is Bonnie Kaplan. Uh, Bonnie Kaplan, PhD, is a professor emerita in the Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. She's published widely on the biological basis of developmental disorders and mental health, particularly the contribution of nutrition to brain development and brain function. Her nutrition-related studies have focused on broad-spectrum micronutrient treatments for mental disorders and the effect of intrauterine nutrition on brain development and maternal health, and she's going to speak to us about the importance of nutrition and mental health. Where is Bonnie Kaplan? Oh, this company. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay, good. Thank you. This is the equivalent of sitting on telephone books at the dinner table when I was little. Ta da! <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what a wonderful audience, and, and I want to thank uh, all the staff and faculty for putting together a really terrific program. I'm very pleased to be a part of it. So I'm going to talk about something different, but possibly related to the previous presentation. Okay. Um, this is a, a standard disclosure slide. I have no commercial interest in any company or sale of any product. And I also usually show a disclaimer, too. I want you to know that I know, because I know you know, that nutrition isn't magic. It's not the be-all and end-all. And there are lots of causes of mental challenges. It's just that I'm only talking about nutrition. And also, I wanted to mention, I don't know, Victoria just slipped out of the room. Um, I thought it was wonderful the way she incorporated the idea of tools working together that are presented at this meeting in her uh, talk on anxiety yesterday. And that's how nutrition works in synergy. So this is an overview of what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk about bad news. Then I'm going to give you a little bit of information about how the brain works, then the good news and then some practical ideas for you and your patients and clients. So let's start off with this. Uh, don't answer, just think about this. What do these characteristics resemble? Depression, hysteria is an old-fashioned term. We might call it mania or anxiety, high anxiety now. Uh, we might use a different term for self-mutilation, self-harm. But I think if you look through that list, what you see is depression, anxiety, and ADHD. I'm going to come back to that. This is a study that came out recently about Canadian data, but I assure you it's the same in the United States and every other Western country, and it's shocking. It was, not a, a ran, it was a random sample from a very large group. It's our, our Cross Canada Canadian uh, Community Health Survey. They analyzed the nutrient and caloric intake for Canadians over the age of two all the way up to the top. And then they divided them according to whether or not their nutrient intake was from whole foods, various levels of slightly processed and more processed foods, or what you see on this slide, ultra-processed foods. And half, if you don't mind me rounding up from 48%, half of the caloric intake of all Canadians is ultra-processed food. That means no nutrients. So what happens to people whose, in other words, our societies, whose nutrient intake is 50% of what it should or could be? And of course, most of this has been happening since World War II. Well, we know. We know because of that other slide I showed you. Six months of nutrient deprivation at a 50% level in 36 normal healthy men were reported from a University of Minnesota starvation experiment. They did a lot of starvation experiments after World War II when people were let out of the camps, and most of them were focused on the GI tract and physical health things, but somebody did look at mental health. And this is what happens. Depression, anxiety, and attention problems at 50%. So we're doing this massive experiment in the public right now on ourselves and is it any wonder that we have an increase in these disorders? So we know the mental health impact of cutting nutrient intake. Now some more bad news. 
what if even in that 50%, because you're sitting there thinking, that's okay, I don't eat from the lowest level, I eat from whole food, which is great, that's what we have to do, what we should do. But what if even in that 50% that is not in the lowest level, what if we're getting fewer minerals and vitamins than our ancestors did? Time for a little review. Now, I know that some of you know this, but I've discovered that a lot of people, it's kind of like not thinking about where your beef comes from. You know, we don't, it comes in packages with cellophane or something, right? Plastic wrap around it. We don't think about how plants grow unless we have an agricultural background. So forgive me if this sounds like I'm talking down to you, but it's just a little reminder. Plants grow in soil. The soil has well, except I gotta wonder about hydroponics. When I finish this talk, if someone wants to talk about it knowledgeably, I'd love to hear. Anyway, plants absorb approximately 15 minerals from the soil if the minerals are there. And what do they do with them? Well, plants are smarter than you and me. We cannot synthesize vitamins except a small amount in our gut, a little bit of the B vitamins, but plants know how to do it. They take those 15 minerals, if they're there, and they synthesize a whole bunch of vitamins. So we come along, because we need approximately 30 vitamins and minerals, we come along and we eat the plants, or we eat the animals who have eaten the plants, and if we're lucky, we get all 30 minerals and vitamins. But if they're not there, we don't. So this is some unpublished data collected in Western Canada recently. We had 40 soil assays that were randomly selected from a larger set of 80, representing all four Western Canadian provinces. That's British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And it's a significant area. It's 30% of, of the land which is cultivated in Canada. And you know, just like with lab tests, you have a minimally accepted level, and then you have a level that's too high for any value that you're looking at. We use the Albrecht method, which does the same thing for each individual mineral in the soil. And this is what we found. Of course, we would like to have 100% of the minerals above the lowest level, just like when you're looking at serum assays. And this is what we found. So I, you might not be able to read along the bottom, although I'm sure some of you are following uh, my slides online. Um, but I'll just read it to you from the left. It's calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, boron, iron, manganese, copper, zinc, cobalt, molybdenum, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphate. And what you can see there, I think the next, yeah, this just shows 50%. Not, I mean, not even 50% of them, way less than that, meet the minimum standards. It just happens in this distribution of samples Magnesium came out looking not too badly. I don't know if that would be replicated elsewhere. You cannot conclude from that that magnesium is good in the soil in any particular area. But overall, it clearly shows we have a problem. So if the minerals aren't in the soil, and clearly we have a problem there, then what are our plants using to synthesize our vitamins? And you're sitting there thinking, that's OK, I eat organic. It might not be okay. Think about what organic means. It says nothing about min uh, mineral or nutrient density. Organic means pesticide and herbicide free. Now that's a good thing. I think we should all try to eat organic and we should support organic farmers and everything. It just happened that we had two samples of almost adjacent fields, one organic and one not. So I'll show you what we found there. The green bars are the organic fields the blue ones are not. And the low bar is the 50% of ideal, and the red bar at the top is the 100%. So once again, really strong evidence for mineral deficiency, and it's not related to being organic. I was surprised at this, because I, I think of organic farmers as being better stewards of, pardon me, better stewards of the soil, and they probably are, but it doesn't show up in this way. Now, is this a problem? I've just talked to you about this experiment we're doing in society. This is a book uh, published by E. Fuller Torrey. Some of you have probably heard of him, and Judy Miller in 2001. And on the basis of data prior to 1750 compared to data from 1750 to 1960, they said, oh my gee, except they don't say it that way, 
we have a tripling of mental disorders. The prevalence of mental illness has tripled. This is an invisible plague. And that's what they called their book. And I wonder if they wrote another one now, what they would call the over 20%. It's no longer invisible. And what is a stronger word than plague? I don't know. So the take home message from all this bad news is that mental health problems are epidemic. Do you know someone? Would you quickly raise your hand if someone close to you, and I don't mean a patient or a client, I mean a loved one, a family member, uh, has struggled with mental, or yourself, struggled with mental disorders? Okay, isn't that phenomenal? It's really close to 100%, and that's true in every audience that I speak to. Now raise your hand if conventional psychiatric medication has resolved the problem in the people you're thinking of. Ah, okay, three. <laughs> That's more, I didn't mean to be funny. <laughs> That's more than I usually see. It's usually zero. So I'll remember, I will no longer say you get no one when you do this kind of survey. Okay, three out of 900. So conventional treatments are not helping enough. I I think we can agree on that. If they were, the rates would be going down. It's as simple as that. So we're all looking elsewhere. And now I'm going to turn to the other topic I mentioned. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the brain function. And here I'm going to do what your previous speaker said, which is we should be teaching this in schools. I should not be teaching it. All of our kids in elementary school should learn about this. So this is what we all should have been taught. Each of us has four to six liters of blood inside us, one liter, I'm sorry, quart, same thing, approximately passing through our brain every minute. And the reasons for that, as you know, are to bring oxygen and to bring nutrients and to take away waste products. And there are some other immunologic functions too. So it's complex, but bringing nutrients to the brain is a really important part of that. Have you ever wondered why we have evolved to need so many nutrients every minute? Because that's a quart of blood in your tiny, tiny little brain, which is only 2% roughly of your body weight. It's a real, you know, our brain is gobbling up. It is metabolically the most active organ, although I think cardiologists might sometimes say, no, it's the heart. But so maybe they're tied. But anyway, we are eating primarily to feed our brains and our hearts. So why have we evolved to need so many nutrients every minute? It comes down to brain metabolism. Metabolism, as you know, is just the transformation of one compound to another. So if you have chemical A, you want to convert it to chemical B, or you want your brain to convert it to chemical B, you have to have enzymes there. And enzymes have to do the work. But they can't do the work unless you have enough cofactors. Cofactors for enzymes, that's what vitamins and minerals are doing in the brain. And then you can do the transformation. Now, the next couple slides on brain metabolism, I've taught to people as low as sixth grade. And whenever I have given a talk to, and people have given me feedback about my slides, I'm always told at first they looked at these slides. If they didn't have a biochemical bath background, they were daunting. And later they said, it's the only thing I'm going to remember of what you said. So <laughs> we'll see if that's true of you. This is an abridged piece of a very, very, very complex set of pathways involving serotonin. You can see in red. I'm very bad with pointers. But OK, serotonin, oh, and I'm pointing in the wrong place. <laughs> That's probably why I have to point up here. Serotonin. <laughs> I, I have a beautiful presentation in front of me here. And tryptophan and melatonin. They're in red just because you probably know what they are. The other chemicals on that picture, you don't need to know what they are. The point is that every arrow is an enzymatic reaction. And you can go online, and you can click on these arrows and ask the question, what vitamins and minerals, what nutrients are needed to make that step happen? And this is what you find. So going from tryptophan to 5-hydroxyl tryptophan, you need iron, phosphorus, and calcium. Vitamin B6 there. B6, riboflavin, iron there, vitamin B6 there. A lot of people think, oh, you have to, and I heard it said in one of the talks yesterday, you got to have your B vitamins to convert tryptophan to serotonin. But, I mean, it's much more than that, more than B vitamins. If you take a look, zinc, iron and niacin, et cetera, and throughout the entire graph, okay? So the bottom line is if you don't provide a brain with adequate vitamins and minerals, and not just one of them, but all of them, 
to cover all of those pathways, these pathways are sluggish. That is not a DSM diagnosis, but that's maybe underlying a lot of the DSM diagnoses. We want to optimize brain function. Um, hold on. So that was tryptophan. Um, I don't know why you're getting a big red X there. Uh, the picture, it was just a picture of food. Anyway, this graph was um, prepared by uh, my colleague Jenny Johnstone, who's in the audience, and she did it in a circular form to, do, to look at dopamine. It's the same thing if you look at every step along the way, you'll see a bunch of vitamins and minerals. I haven't said anything about omega-3 fatty acids, and of course, I hope you are eating fish and you are telling your clients to eat fish or getting them onto a good fish oil kind of supplement. But you might not realize that in order to get your omega-3, now these are the omega-3 pathways, okay, the metabolic pathway going down and omega-6, and you do not get this enzymatic activity like the delta-6 desaturase in the middle, et cetera, unless you have what? You've got to have the cofactors present. So for proper uh, metabolism, even, of the omega-3s, you must have a lot of vitamins and minerals on board. That's the me message. Now, knowing that, which vitamin or mineral would you select to optimize brain health? I know what the funding agencies say. They say pick one, because my colleagues who have tried to get funding in the states for excellent clinical trials of broad spectrum, 30 vitamins and minerals, get it sent back saying, wonderful study, wonderful trial, wonderful team. Why don't you pick one of those nutrients to study? So that's how NIMH works. It's not how the brain works. I'll say more about that later. Yeah. So at any rate, uh, and also, I mean, many of us in this audience, we all look for magic bullets, don't we? And we tend to focus on one or two when we talk about important nutrients for the brain. But I look at those pathways, and I don't know how we can justify that. So I'm going to move on. The role of nutrients in the brain is not a mystery. I've only talked about metabolism. These other topics that are also very related, I'm going to be covering in the workshop this afternoon. That's a shameless pitch to come to the workshop that Scott Shan and I are giving if you're interested in that. I need to move on to the good news. So the most important good news is and you know this, diet is a modifiable risk factor. When you're dealing with your clients, your patients, you cannot go back and get rid of trauma. You cannot fix some of those families that you just want to reach out and shake, but maybe you can educate the person in front of you about diet. This, is, this whole conference has been about so far about healing and resilience and building on the other concepts of flourishing, et cetera, presented here, I want you to think about nutrition. And in particular, um, and I've been pitching this to a few people individually, we need to do some studies of pre-treating people with broad-spectrum micronutrients, minerals and vitamins, and then introducing therapeutic kinds of interventions, whatever else you're doing, lifestyle, psychotherapy, or whatever, because we hear so many anecdotes of people coming to us and saying, after I took micronutrients, I could think clearly and utilize the skills that people had been teaching me, and I couldn't really make use of that information until then. So we need to all work together on these um, lifestyle things. But for this talk, I have to provide you with some proof that nutrient treatment has a beneficial impact. So I've already shown you the top one, the, and that's the University of Minnesota study. It's an important link. I can go back 2,600 years, but there's no time here. But I do have that lecture online if you want an hour of um, the history of knowing the role of nutrients in brain function. But for now, we, just, we know that people who are deprived of nutrients uh, express more mental health problems. I'm going to talk about these other three areas, giving you illustrations. So there are at least 15 population health studies showing that the Mediterranean diet results in, and that's broadly speaking, Mediterranean whole foods diet, lower rates of mood and anxiety symptoms, and our Western diet is associated with higher rates of mood and anxiety symptoms. And these studies are from all over the world, Australia, Spain, et cetera. In fact, these studies are coming out so many times now, I wish that the funding agencies would stop funding them because they're very expensive to do, and we know it already. 
There are lots of other important things, you can tell my bias, that we need to study. So um, I do want to show you, though, unless there is something novel about it, and this is one of my PhD student, Karen Davison, showed something I think really important in a correlational study, and that is that you could take about 100 people with mood disorders and study their intake over just three days, not change their medication, not change anything else in their life, and literally in three days we could see a relationship between their food intake and their overall mental function, and nobody was more surprised than me. But these are, this is in your slides, I won't dwell on it, but this is seven vitamins and seven minerals. The only one that was not significantly correlated, whoops, sorry, uh, not significantly correlated with overall assessment of functioning was sodium, and of course, why would it be? But it's interesting that the minerals, if anything, were slightly more highly correlated, although all of them were statistically significant. Uh, and this one, again, it's a unique study. It was not done by my group, but it was done in northern Alber Alberta, um, showing as, as early as the fifth grade, uh, they were able to show a correlation between the amount, the kind of score on healthy eating and the amount of worries and sadness that the children reported. What are we doing to our children? You know, we do need more, I think co more correlational studies in young children would be worthwhile. Let's move on to adequacy of diet predicting the emergence of symptoms. Now, there are only a few studies in this area because it's very, very expensive and hard to do longitudinal prospective research of this type. And I usually use one study as teaching because I think, so some of you may maybe heard me present this before. I think it really illustrates it very well. This was done in Spain and um, they used a semi-quantitative food frequency questionnaire. And none of the participants at the beginning had a diagnosis of a mood or an anxiety problem. That's really important to understand. They evaluated their eating for commercial baked goods and fast foods and put it all together in an unhealthy diet score. So we're going to do that here with some pretend data. So we're going to pretend that the first three rows are the people who ate pretty well, okay? You had a low unhealthy diet score, a good healthy diet score, and it's based on whole foods, okay, and Mediterranean diet. You folks in the middle were medium. You folks over here in the last three rows or columns, you ate an awful lot of processed food. So then we sit back and just watch to see over time who develops depression. And this is what they found. We arbitrarily set your risk at 1.0 because there is a baseline level of depression that, that would be expected. And what we found is that you folks in the middle really did not differ. Okay, you were 1.02 risk, not, not really different, but the people over there are in trouble, and I suggest you mend your ways. Um, <laughs> and that was an important finding, that the eating style preceded emergence of symptoms. But the other important finding is what we learned from you folks in the middle, which is it's okay to eat something occasionally, okay? You don't have, I would not be a good purist on any topic in the world, so I'm very comforted by this. The chocolate dessert last night was wonderful, okay? If that was for the faculty dinner, I'm sorry the rest of you didn't get it, but I'm sure, <laughs> it was. But I'm sure you had other wonderful things to eat, and I hope you don't feel guilty about it, as long as most of the time you are eating whole foods. So I'm not saying, and the data don't say that muffins cause depression, it's that with every bite we make a choice, and when we hear eat from the rainbow, you know which slide or which picture it means. Okay, now the last topic in this part of the talk is that symptoms can be successfully treated with improved diet and or nutrient supplements. Uh, a recent meta-analysis, I'm not a fan of meta-analyses for a whole lot of reasons, but there was a recent meta-analysis I thought I should tell you about, published in Psychosomatic Medicine, that they covered about 16 randomized controlled trials, trials of the whole diet approach and found there was a sig evidence for a significant benefit of improved diet for depression. So as we collect more and more data on these whole diet approaches, um, the, you know, we'll get more information on other symptoms. I'm going to show you um, 
I've tried to combine two studies in one slide. The investigators aren't in the room, so maybe I don't have to ask their forgiveness. But it just happens that they were both done in Australia, but by completely separate teams. I wonder if they hadn't been in the same country if I would have tried to combine them. But anyway, um, Felice Jacka and Natalie Parletta, in the same year, published Whole Diet Approach. And they did it with adults with major depressive disorder and a poor diet. So they took a group, of each, in each case, they took a group of people with major depression, randomized them to get either dietary counseling or peer support. Now, you cannot use a placebo in this kind of whole diet approach. What would the placebo be? You have to use a comparator. And of course, most comparators that you would use, it would be ethical, are active comparators. And we know peer support is very helpful. But, and what they found, what both studies found, is that people who got dietary counseling for a Mediterranean kind of whole foods diet did better than those who were in the uh, peer support. But the next slide shows you, I think, oh, this is, you know what the Mediterranean diet looks like. Okay. But the combined results of both studies show, on this slide shows you the result that I think is the most mind-boggling. It wasn't a question of getting better, but... 8% of those who received peer counseling went into remission, no longer meeting criteria for major depression, but almost a third, now that's from the, these numbers are from the SMILES trial, almost a third went into remission as a result of dietary counseling. Has anybody ever heard of an antidepressant that resulted in any antidepressant that resulted in a one-third remission rate. And, you know, Dr. Weil yesterday talked about how the, the distance between active and placebo seems to be shrinking over time, and that certainly seems to be the case. Like, they're satisfied with a three-point difference on a Hamilton depression rating scale. And yet, it's the antidepressants like Prozac that get on the cover of Time magazine. When this came out, I started using it a lot in teaching, and I said, this should be on the cover of Time magazine because a one-third remission rate from changing diet with no side effects, okay, is worthy of note and replicated immediately by Parletta's study. And yet the media does not cover nutrition research unless the results are negative. I hope you realize that. Have you noticed that? Raise your hand if you've noticed that. You read about how nutrients are bad for you and that kind of thing, but you don't read about any of our positive results on nutrition and mental health. The other thing, as Parletta showed very, very clearly, is that those whose diets improved the most showed the most improvement. And by the way, everyone says, oh, it costs too much to eat that way. That is not the case. You know, it's expensive to eat chips and, and drink pop all the time. And some of the processed foods, even that aren't that egregious, but it's, it can be very expensive. So the recommended diet was, in fact, less expensive in the SMILES trial. Now, is there also an argument to be made for nutrients in pill form? I hope so, because that's what I've spent most of the last 20 years of my life doing. Um, there are a couple of good reasons. First of all, a good diet might not be sufficient for optimal brain function. Why is that? Well, one I already showed you, and that is the impoverished nutrient density of our soil. Get out there and talk to people who are working on, there are lots of good people working on nutrient density of the soil. If you can be of any help to them and support of them, you should do that. But the other thing is individual differences. And we have seen in our studies, this is anecdotal, but we've seen people who seem to eat good diets. And a good diet that's adequate for somebody else might not be for them, because then when they take additional minerals and vitamins, their symptoms get better. So we already know about individual differences. We should not be surprised. And well, I won't go any further into that. At any rate, um, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm going to divide this next few sets of slides into two things. One is studying people um, without diagnoses, people with our, our not clinical samples, okay? And in that area, the most underappreciated treatment is B-complex, okay? And actually, Victoria mentioned this yesterday in her um, anxiety symposium. There, it, there are more RCTs even than you presented, uh, Victoria, showing that B-complex decreases stress and anxiety in both stressed and non-stressed populations. But 
if you look at clinical samples, and it's important you understand, I've, I've never seen anybody in a clinical sample get rid of you know, bipolar disorder or psychosis or anything with a B complex. If you look at clinical samples, then you seem to need for treatment the broad spectrum, meaning the roughly 30 minerals and vitamins. In that area, we also have level A evidence. We have multiple randomized control trials. We have trials with active comparators, comparators um, that are not placebo controlled. They're active versus comparator. We have um, on-off control of symptoms, which you can do in the setting when you're working with nutrients. It's harder to do with medications. And they cover a wide span of different kinds of disorders. Where are we? You know, what are we using to study these things? Um, we currently have three complex formulas in the Western world um, that are, have been studied by independent scientists. There's a fourth one from the states that I'm very hopeful for. We need lots more. And um, especially those of us who study these formulas, people think, well, if there are only one or two, like we must be working for the company. And none of us does. And it makes us more comfortable. And there's a great need out there. So two of them were developed in Alberta. One is um, by True Hope. The second one by Hardy Nutritionals. Hardy Nutritionals has a table out here, so you might have seen them. Uh, one was developed in Arizona by the Autism Nu Nutrition Research Center, Jim Adams' work. Um, we can't get it in Canada anymore, and I think uh, that group is actually, although they're still doing some nutrition work, they're doing a lot more work on fecal transplant, pardon me for autism, which I don't have time to go into now. But those are the three. What they have in common is that no one who has studied any of them will ever gain financially from sales. If you're in the mental health world, you know what a dramatic statement that is. I mean, I'm old enough to remember what it was like before our literature was corrupted by pharmaceutical money and our rounds were all paid for by pharmaceutical companies and, to, and our studies were all done and paid for by pharmaceutical companies. So um, we decided to do it differently in the nutrition world. And so none of us um, will ever get money from it. The formulas all have about 30 minerals and vitamins, so we call them broad spectrum. We're not studying a formula, we're studying a concept that the brain needs all the minerals and vitamins. And all have been shown in multiple studies, including randomized control trials, to improve mood regulation, uh, although the third one has been restricted to people with autism because it's the Autism Research Center. Now, the next two slides I just slipped in last night when um, a colleague of mine who sat in on the ADHD workshop or, or uh, presentation yesterday said that none of the empirical evidence on ADHD using broad spectrum micronutrients was mentioned. And I hadn't planned to present that to you. As you'll see, I decided to focus on a different topic, but I was disturbed that that was the case, and I thought I'd just tell you there are about uh, 10 or more, most of it, though not all, from Dr. Julia Rucklidge's group from University of Canterbury and Christchurch, New, Ze New Zealand, and Jenny Johnstone, who I mentioned before. Raise your hand, Jenny. If anybody wants to know more about it, she's the second author on the first couple of papers there. She was in New Zealand at the time, but is now in Oregon Health and Sciences Center. And here are some of the other references. Children and adults with ADHD. There's a lot of research on broad spectrum micronutrients, minerals and vitamins for ADHD and the associated mood components. And I'm sorry you didn't hear about that before and that I didn't put it in my talk because I have to move on. But we'll give you the studies if you want them, okay? So this is what I decided. I decided I had to pick an area and I thought this is a very mixed audience. I thought I'd talk about general anxiety and stress. And this story actually starts with uh, Julia Rucklidge also. Because in September of 2010, when she was doing her RCT on adults with ADHD, that is when Christchurch, New Zealand had that major earthquake, you might remember. And she found after the earthquake that, um, oh, and by the way, prior to the earthquake, everybody had been assessed for the study. After the quake, she found about 15 people who had been taking the formula. It was one of the Alberta formulas. Um, taking a formula during the earthquake and about 15 people who weren't? Well, what a great chance to do a matched study. And she did that and reported on it. And those who had been taking um, one of the uh, Alberta formulas were, in fact, much less, they had much less depression, anxiety, and stress than the group that had not. And that's published. But then along came 
Um, I'm not going to go over that. Along came the second major er earthquake five months later, February 22nd, 2011. I got this uh, slide from Julia who put it in right to the minute. It was at 12.51 p.m. But you can see why. It was a very emotional and devastating earthquake, and many people died, and a third of Christchurch downtown was destroyed. And so she went and did a randomized control trial, which she couldn't do after the first earthquake because no one you know, really knew that was coming. And so this is the impact of micronutrients on stress, anxiety, and PTSD symptoms in people randomized to get either B-complex or one of the Alberta formulas broad spectrum at a low dose or that same formula at a higher dose. And it was a four-week trial. All the treatment groups got better, which is kind of what we would predict. Remember, this is not a clinical sample. It's general population, and a B-complex helped a lot of people. Uh, the Alberta formula helped a lot of people. Basically, they built resilience in people, and I don't have all the slides with me. I want to show you the PTSD slide, because this is amazing. So the first set of bars is the um, control group. The blue is baseline, and the yellow is four weeks later. And if you look, you'll see that B-complex and the multi-nutrient multi formula at low dose and at high dose, those who um, uh, they used, sorry, I'm tangled up in my sentence. They used the impact of events scale to evaluate those who met criteria for PTSD. Those who took any of the nutrient formulas had dramatic decrease in their PTSD in four weeks. Doesn't that make you want to help some people with PTSD? <laughs> if you look at it all together, the pooled data showed PTSD levels went from about 62% to 19% in four weeks. So I'm going to move on and show you, oh, and this is the long-term data. They did a one-year follow-up, something you don't often see in drug trials, but we're trying to do with the nutrient studies. And you can see that those who were on the nutrients, the treated group, were better after a year. OK, this is where I live on a good day. Um, not February, March, or April, but maybe June. Uh, you can see the Rocky Mountains in the background. But this is what it looked like one day in after a major flood. They called it a 100-year flood, but they're calling a lot of things 100-year floods now, right, that are not, yeah, they're more often. Anyway, so um, this happened after the earthquakes, and Julia called me, and we decided to put together a study. But there was a huge difference, because in New Zealand, they had had 8,000 earthquakes. They call them aftershocks. 8,000 earthquakes between the first major one and the second major one. And I was dealing with our city, which had had a single event on one day. So I didn't think we'd see much. We had adults who were randomized to one of three groups. No placebo is ethical in a crisis situation like that. We used the same scale that she had used. And we had people who got single nutrient, vitamin D, 1,000 IUs, few nutrients, which was B-complex, or one of the Alberta broad spectrum formulas. And this is what we found. So this is an active comparator now. And there was some improvement from a small amount of vitamin D. This is the drop in depression, anxiety, and stress. We went out to six weeks. And you can see there was no difference between the B-complex and the broad spectrum. Oh, that's very weird. I don't remember what was there, so it can't have been important. I think it was another picture. So why not just test for deficiencies in people instead of using a broad spectrum formula, which is a shotgun approach? We know it's a shotgun approach. Um, but uh, again, the New Zealand team has published two papers, actually, trying to determine whether serum levels of nutrients predicted treatment response, whether MTHFR status predicted uh, treatment, uh, treatment response, demographic variables, et cetera. And the answer is no. Basically, there are no specific demographic or clinical uh, characteristics right now, including the MTHFR status, that have, uh, really identifies who will benefit from one of these formulas. So why not just try it under proper guidance? Oh, my. OK, my pictures have just totally disappeared. So practical suggestions. I'm moving to the last part of my talk. I want to talk to you about being practical for yourself, for your clients, et cetera. Um, even though I studied 
during my career, I'm no longer an active researcher, studied nutrients in pill form, I always said I was studying a proof of concept because we cannot put the whole world on pills. We have to first get people eating better, and even before that, we have to improve the soil and have healthier food and get rid of glyphosate Roundup, which is sequestering some of those minerals and affecting us in other ways. So focus on the importance of real food first. And I always say to people, look, some of these specialty diets are interesting and help lots of people. Um, but for the general population, we would really have a big impact if we could just get people to follow Michael Pollan's rules of, you know, just eating whole food and walking around the outer part of the grocery store and don't eat anything which your, there it is, don't eat anything that your ancestors would not recognize as being food, etc. We'd have a big impact. I think we'd have a big impact if the metabolic pathways were taught in elementary school. And if they were taught in medical school. Is that asking too much? <laughs> you know, I mean, why is it that psychiatrists, I wish I had a nickel for every time a psychiatrist has said to me, Bonnie, those vitamins and minerals you're studying, they don't, they can't actually affect the brain, can they? It's like, what do you think? <laughs> well, never mind. Anyway, but you know, you can, you can have an effect on yourselves if you when you're thinking of certain kinds of foods, think about those metabolic pathways and how you want to feed them. So you want to eat from this kind of diagram, the meta, you know, Mediterranean kind of diet, and not this. You want to teach your clients to eat porridge or oatmeal rather, oh, rather than one of my wonderful pictures that isn't showing. You want to, um, you've got a lot of options down here for carbonated water. A lot of people are just used to drinking carbonated drinks, carbonated water without sugar or artificial sugar. Drink that kind of thing, or better yet, water or tea. Trust me, that's what's there. But not sodas or diet sodas. And to save money, to save money, this is the most important thing I think you could do for your clients and in mental health centers is to teach people how they can live on just a few dollars a week, really, if they learn how to cook beans, legumes, lentils, all that kind of stuff, and go online and get some of those recipes. Let's get everyone in our families to learn to cook from scratch. Now, some people don't like to do meal prep, but now you can buy these things cut up. There are people who really, that's a big obstacle, cutting up the vegetables and the garlic. What can clinicians do? You can start the conversation. You can't do it by saying, do you eat a good diet? <laughs> you know? Or how have you eaten today? You know, people get a little defensive. Oh, yeah, I eat fine. You have to ask a few questions. So you have to gently work into it. And I gave you some wording in the slides. There's an increasing amount of scientific data showing that what we eat influences how we feel. Even in three days, it's been shown. Let's talk about your diet. Use Amy Paxton, start the conversation. There are no right or wrong answers to these four questions. You don't score anything, but it enables you as a clinician to talk about them with your patients. Perhaps recommend B-complex for improving resilience to stress. In every mental health setting and every family practice, you could educate people about nutrition. We can teach children about it too. They currently think that food has to be a treat. Eating out should be a rare event. And as clinicians, start first with nutrition. That's my view of the better world before we expose a developing brain to any psychiatric medication. First, nutrition. And I give you two ways you can become a nutrition activist with the media, which is so down on, pardon me, on nutrition. I gave you an example about the MIND diet. How many of you know about the MIND diet research, cutting Alzheimer's risk by 50%? Why isn't that in the news more? That's a good set of studies from Illinois. If you hear or read a report of the escalating mental health problems on campus, you could call and say, you know, living on ramen and sodas might be part of the problem. Uh, you Americans need to keep track of what your FDA is doing because on February 11th they announced that they're going to reevaluate Deshaies, which you've had for 25 years. And this could be a good thing, or it might not be a good thing. I, there's no way to know yet, but you need to watch it. It's happening in Canada right now, and um, the, what is being proposed will bankrupt our natural health product companies. So we're a little concerned about it. Keep your eyes on that. Finally, I want to mention to you, because I keep telling you the media doesn't cover this, and 
and uh, you cannot get funding for a multi-nutrient study very easily. Um, so when I was preparing for this so-called retirement that I'm in, um, I set up, to, yeah, right. Uh, I set up two charitable funds. I do not get a penny. One is in the U.S., one is in Canada. And we, uh, it's, we've been very successful in raising almost $600,000. It's all distributed. There is a multi-center trial I mentioned that uh, Jenny Johnstone is leading, and that's cross-border Canadian and U.S. There is a study in Maine. There is a study in New Zealand, but we are always looking for funds for that. And so I put that in every single talk I give, no matter to what audience. Just want you to know that that's what we have to do right now. But thank you for your interest in nutrition.